Hi everyone, and welcome to my video on the Pentax H3. This is an interchangeable lens SLR film camera with an M42 lens mount. M42 is also called the universal mount because it was used by Zeiss, Mamiya, bunches of other companies that aren't coming to mind right now. And you can get adapters for M42 to basically any modern camera, although with some limitations in use. Uh, and some of them don't allow infinity focusing, but at any rate, M42 is um, the universal mount. This was the first Pentax with automatic aperture control, and what that meant is that it was the first Pentax where you sh hit the shutter release, and there is a little flap down here that would hit flap up and stop down the lens's aperture right before the picture was taken. Take the picture and then allow the lens aperture to open back up so you could view the image at um, full aperture. In fact, this might have been the first camera model with that. I'm not sure about that. Models made uh, after this, so there were two, there was a, a construction variation in the H3. You can see this has a notch right next to the T. You might be able to see that. If not, trust me, there's a notch right there. So models made after 1963 have this notch, and that was a notch so that the clip-on light meter that, that clips onto the eyepiece could control the shutter speed. Models made before 1963, I don't think that they can mount the, the clip-on light meter. Or if they can, it doesn't, it doesn't control the shutter. It would be a mess to use, but I just think they can't mount it. The target market for the H3 was the average user, and by and large, this predated market segmentization as we know it today, uh, but it was really, it was intended for somebody who would shoot casually or wasn't out to uh, try to take award-winning or professional great photo uh, photographs. Though that said, it's still a very good camera. The produ for production, this was produced by Asahi Optical Company and the Pentax is the brand, and this particular one was imported to the U.S. by Honeywell. Uh, this the H3 is any of the ones in the U.S. that were sold, which is the H's, I believe, um, will have Honeywell Pentax on them because Honeywell imported it, and this predates when Asahi stopped using Honeywell to import. Uh, it went into production in 1961, but I wasn't able to find when it went out of production. Some of Sometimes these details are difficult to track down, but it would have been sometime in the 1960s, probably shortly after the H3V, or whatever was subs the Spotmatics were introduced. They were made in Japan. Even the uh, Honeywell models were made in Japan. Uh, this is one of the first 35 millimeter SLRs with the M42 mount the Pentax released, and so it was preceded by the M39 mount Asahi Flex cameras. Um, and it was concurrent with the S or H1, and depending on your market, it would either be called the S1 or the H1. The S or H2, uh, same thing. The S3, which is the same as this camera, and the uh, SV or H3V, uh, which are again the same camera. This is uh, this was followed by the K mount and the M series. Uh, that, uh, well, it was followed immediately by the Spotmatics, and then the Spotmatics led to the K and the M series cameras. So now let's take a look. If you have your instruction manual, you can follow along. Uh, we're just going to go in that same order, and we'll just uh, start looking at the camera top and sides and bottoms, and we'll see what all the different features on the camera okay. are. Okay, so here we are on the top, and we're going to start with the shutter speed dial. And this camera has shutter speeds of 1 1,000th down to T. T being you push the shutter release button to open it, push it again to close it, which differs from B. for T stands for time, B stands for bulb. Bulb is push it and hold it, and as long as you hold it, the shutter's open. And then one second down to 1 1,000th with a flash X sync here of about 1 50th. The rapid wind lever right here, and this was a big deal back in the day because prior to SLRs of this generation, you advanced the film with a knob instead of a lever. Uh, the film exposure counter, which is right here, and this is not an automatically resetting exposure counter. And in order to, uh, when you load film, oops, you've got to, there we go, that works a little bit better. 
set the uh, reset the counter when you load the new film. And you actually, I overset it. You need to set it to like negative three. At any rate, uh, if you when you open this, it does not automatically reset, unlike many film cameras you might be used to. Then we have this shutter release itself right here, and then there's an orange dot which you can see next to where I'm pointing, and that is the cocked indicator. When it's orange, it indicates that the camera is ready to take a photo. The um, film type reminder dial over here, and this is uh, white is for monochrome, orange is for tungsten, and green is for daylight. And so what it has is a series of ISOs from 25 up to 800 for black and white, uh, 10 to 100, I'm sorry, orange is for DIN uh, ratings, not for tungsten. So uh, DIN 10 up to DIN 100. And then uh, same thing for green. Green is actually DIN as well. And so orange would be tungsten DIN and uh, green would be daylight DIN. And then white would be black and white in ISO. Uh, they have the film rewind knob over here, and uh, unlike most cameras, pulling this up does not automatically open the back of the camera. And the film rewind crank, which folds out of the film rewind knob. On the camera's front, we have the strap lugs, which I have split rings connected to. And the lens mount right here, the lens mount, as I said, is the M42 screw mount. So I'll take the body cap cover off. And as I, I might have mentioned, this, uh, um, this camera's got a few mechanical issues, so it's not going to demonstrate everything today, unfortunately. One of them is that the lens's mirror is stuck upwards. So unfortunately, we can't look through the camera lens in the second video. Uh, let me just leave that off for now. Uh, the next thing we have over here, we have the X-Flash Terminal and the FP-Flash Terminal. And uh, then on the camera side, we have the film door release right there. And then on the back, we have the film back, the uh, uh, viewfinder eyepiece, as well as the accessory, uh, accessory fitting grooves on the sides of the viewfinder eyepiece and your Asahi Optical Company Japan and uh, indicate earth mark right there. Uh, on the camera's bottom we have the film release button which is what you push to, to allow the film to be rewound and the tripod bushing. Now you'll notice that there's no camera battery chamber anywhere on here and that's because this camera does not take a battery. So it's a hundred percent mechanical. You don't ever have to worry about a battery corroding in it unless you put the battery inside of it for some reason like in the film chamber. You don't really want to do that. Inside the camera, I'm going to open it up with the back release over here on the side. And it, this model, this one doesn't spring open. I don't know if it's supposed to or not. But this one doesn't. Now inside it looks basically like a standard SLR from at any point in history. We've got the film rewind arm over here and the film chamber. We've got the cloth focal plane shutter curtain and the film guide rails. These ones keep the guide, the film, properly aligned, and these help to keep it flat. Sprockets for the take-up wheel, and this is what um, keeps the film from moving backwards and helps keep tension on it. Then we've got the take-up wheel itself. On the back, we have the film pressure plate over here and a spring to keep the um, film cassette in place. Now, you'll notice that this doesn't have any rollers in it to help keep the film uh, flat on plane, and that's partly because this was an entry-level amateur type camera, and partly because this was in the days before tons and tons of effort went into keeping film perfectly, perfectly flat, um, but more because it was, you know, an entry-level camera. And always remember, don't touch the shutter, and don't touch the mirror. Touching the shutter is a good way to ruin a good camera and turn it into a doorstop. Touching the mirror is a good way to desilver de the mirror and make it hard to focus your camera or uh, make your viewfinder a lot dimmer. Also, don't leave your camera equipment in a car, in a hot car, because it's a good way to cause it, just to, to, to ruin it 
uh, by heat exposure cause the grease and the mechanisms to get to places it's not supposed to be. Uh, don't let it get wet or rained on. Don't leave it inside of a plastic bag because you'll get fungus. And just bear in mind that your camera is a precision instrument and should be handled with care and respect. So I hope you stick around now for video two. If this first video was helpful to you, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, and you can also subscribe down below to, uh, to get more video notices. The second video is going to talk a little bit more about how to actually use this camera. And um, unfortunately, I've never actually taken a picture with it because it's been broken as long as I've owned it, so I, I can't share any of those with you. Um, but at any rate, and then uh, if you have any comments or suggestions, please leave those in the comments area. I'm pretty good about responding to them quickly. And lastly, thank you for watching.